Lord, make me an idiot. That's the old prayer. At least that's how it begins. Lord, make me an idiot, an idiot for thy kingdom. Keep me focused on the weeds I need to pull, the garden I am charged with tending, and let the lunatics run and shout as they will, but keep me at work on my humble daily exemplary task. And so as this pandemic script lessens and the nation struggles to come together around much of anything aside from our love for fighting with one another, as we lived in a changed and changing world, discovering an exemplary task is high, at least it's high on my to-do list. I want you to notice something here. It says, thy kingdom, not my kingdom. That's what the prayer says. I think Christianity did itself a disservice when it abandoned this focus and replaced it with individualism. But it's not just Christianity that did this, is it? If you scamper around the playground of Unitarian Universalism, you don't have to look any farther than that great sage of Concord and the lapsed Unitarian minister, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who gave us permission to care single-mindedly about the individual, to care about ourselves. Self-reliance is among Emerson's most famous essays, and it captures his and many people's belief that the center of the universe is me. And I think on some level, all of us are at least a little bit skeptical of rugged individualism, especially when it comes to religion. Franciscan priest Richard Rohr says that junk religion is easily recognizable because it has the assumption that my life, my choices, my fears and wants are what matter most. So junk religion is an individualistic religion. And this kind of self-worship doesn't work in religion because, why? Because it doesn't work anywhere. Just look to Washington, D.C. if you need an example of how individualism doesn't really work. And so if you're the, the type of person that likes to try things for yourself, and so let's say you're married, or let's say you have kids, or let's say you have a job or you had a job, which I hope covers just about all of us in this room, I'm going to give you all an experiment. What I want you to do this next week is I want you at some point to completely disregard your kids, completely disregard your boss, completely disregard your friends or your spouse, and instead I want you to just barrel along doing whatever you want. <laughs> and then I want you to impose your emotions on everything. And I want you to be inconsiderate, and so on. And then, before you leave today, get my cell phone number, and I want you to text me how your week goes. <laughs> and then try to contradict me when I say that individualism is junk religion. That's point number one. So the Christian martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was killed by the Nazis, he wrote in a book, a really thin little book that you should read about how we be a church community, and he wrote these words, quote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die, end quote. When Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Now, if you don't like the word Christ, that's fine. What Bonhoeffer meant is still useful in the sense that by Christ, he means true love. That horizon that tugs at our hearts and bends our path forward into a better, more generous living. And it's the understanding that religious people have been, have, rather they've answered a sacred call to live beyond our selfish wants, beyond our petty squabbles, and into a religious life that sees the universe as something awful, which is to say something worthy of all, because the world, life itself, it's a miracle. But we don't do this very easily. Most days we spend them just trying to control all the little things, and then we try to control all the medium-sized things. <laughs> and then when things don't go the way we want them to go, what do we do? We complain about it. And so we try to give, get people to behave like we want, and everyone does this. You know you do it. It's human to do this. But when you take a minute to reflect, most anyone will admit that the world doesn't behave like we want it to behave most of the time. Do people in traffic behave like you always want them to behave? No. Have you ever driven in your town? It's awful. No one drives good in North County, I don't think. But anyways, <laughs> pandemics. There are school shootings. The rich always get richer. The list of things that don't go the way we want is an endless list. And so the poet and physician Lewis Thomas, he wrote, and I quote, 
In no other century of our brief existence have human beings learned so deeply and so painfully the extent and depth of our ignorance. Junk religion plagues on us when we fail to recognize just how little we really know. When we resist the fact that a heck of a lot is beyond anyone's control. But ignorance is addicting. Ignorance is addicting because it gives us permission to deny mystery and awe and beauty, and we settle instead for outrage and hysteria because feeling like you're smarter than everyone, like the world is dumb and you are smart, is a very satisfying feeling. But it's a feeling that never lasts. Never lasts because we can run from our problems, but what happens when we run from our problems, snowbirds? <laughs> they find you wherever you go. But outrage or pretending like all is right with the world is addictive. And so what do we do? We seek it in booze. We seek it in sex or riots or buying crap that we don't need. Or we prey on people by making their life difficult, by trying to control them. And all these things are absorbing, but they're temporary. And, they dam and the damage they do, unfortunately, can be permanent. And this kind of behavior can kill a person in body, mind, and soul. Junk religion, junk relationships, junk selfishness, none of this can satisfy both the head and the heart. It is with God with whom we have to do. That's a quote by Eugene Peterson. What he's getting at is the same thing as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, life with. Life with and for others. Life with and for love. Life with and for humility. He hath showed me, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's the prophet Micah reminding people who've lost their way to selfishness and deceit to turn around, to change, to be just, to be merciful, and to be humble. The temptation, as we've seen is as, and as we've done, is to reduce life to our size, to rob it of its grandeur, and to assume that nothing in the world is miraculous. So there's this old story I'll tell. It's about a religious scholar who was invited to give a lecture on the topic of miracles. It's one of those lectures that you've probably been to in which the person just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks. And so you sit there and you nod your head every once in a while to keep yourself awake mostly because it's one of those lectures that, has, that leaves you with the impression that you just really have no idea what the heck they're actually talking about. But in this story, there's a brave attendee. And the brave attendee at the end of the lecture, he stood up because he had the courage to ask everyone else what they were thinking. And what this brave person said is he said, hey, teacher, why don't you just give us an example of a miracle? And the old teacher said three words. He said this. He said, it is life. And the old teacher went on asking the audience, and this is a quote. He said, audience, have you wept at anything in the past year? Has your heart beat faster at the sight of young beauty? Have you thought seriously about the fact that one day you were going to die? Do you really listen when people are speaking instead of just waiting for your turn to speak? Is there anybody you know in whose place, if one of you had to suffer great pain, you would volunteer yourself? If your answer to most or all of these questions are no, then you are probably dead. And with that said, the old teacher walked off the stage, and everyone else wondered why he didn't just say that in the first place. <laughs> but the whole exchange can be summarized like this. Life is a gift. Genesis, after all, begins with God creating the universe like an artist. And then God stops at the end of every day and turns and looks and says what? It's good. It's very good. And this image has been stuck in my mind since a couple of weeks back when I listened to an interview with the Nobel Prize winning physicist, Frank Vilcek. Now, I don't think Dr. Vilcek is, believes in God or is a Christian in any traditional sense. In fact, in the, in the interview with him, he calls himself a complementarian, which is too complicated for me to try to describe to you this morning. <laughs> So in the interview, he said something that I found really, really interesting. He said that 
if there is a God, like the God we find in Genesis, the God who creates the earth by speaking it into existence, then that God, at least in the physicist's mind, that God is an artist above all, and that the world God created embodies beautiful ideas. That's from the mind of a physicist. He went on to say, quote, that if you regard the world as a work of art, it helps you understand things. And secondly, it's a pretty good work of art, one with tremendous beauty and creative power. Now, forgive me, I'm a religious scholar, but I'm just going to call it like it is. He stole this idea. He stole it from the Bible because it's right there in Genesis. It's been there for centuries. But it's this creative marvel, this creation of which we are and of which we are a part that we celebrate as people of faith. And we do so because it reminds us that time is always being reborn and that what all of us are waiting for, when you take away the false religion and the temporary satisfactions, what we're waiting for is who we truly are in the coming of grace and truth. But the question, of course, is how do we grow this awareness? How do we see and be in the world like this? By my lights, I say we pray and we meditate in words or silently, and we contemplate. We become new monastics so that we can experience the world not as a place to control and contort, but as a piece of wild art. So the Trappist monk Thomas Merton, he believed that meditation and contemplative prayer acted as an unveiling because it shows us exactly what's going on underneath the polished surfaces of our minds. It shows us what's going on in our hearts and in our bodies. And the ritual of contemplation helps us, in the words of the modern-day mystic Brian McLaren, to see that like wood, reality has a grain. Like a river, it has a current. Like a story, it has characters and settings and conflict and resolution. Creation reveals wisdom through its patterns. It reveals wisdom about its source and purpose and about our quest to be alive, only if we're paying attention. Oh, I don't think prayer has to be formal or dogmatic. You can pray like the late Congressman John Lewis, who said that the best prayer was when you moved your feet. Because the truth is, everything can be a prayer. Everyday people like us who live in suburban and urban places walk past dozens of people who are for us perfect strangers. And if we're not totally ignoring them, we're often making judgments based on their clothes or their bumper stickers, or the way they smell, or the church they walked out of. But what if instead of reducing people down to size, we considered them an answer to someone else's prayer? That they're alive in spite of plane rides, or car rides, and pandemics, and childhood illnesses. Just consider all those people you walk past, and they made it through adolescence, for heaven's sake. <laughs> They made it past all those psychotic menaces that lurk in our midst, and yet there they are, standing right next to us at Piggly Wiggly, buying bread or helping someone out of a car. What if we took just a moment to acknowledge that this person was formed in their mother's womb and everything they've experienced, love and marriage, the death of a child perhaps, broken promises, great hurdles, sleepless nights, laughter, trials, and triumphs. Every single bit of it is right there with them too, because it is. The question is, are you prepared to admire? Am I prepared to respect? Am I ready to show reverence? When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Die to selfishness, die to pettiness, so that we can be reborn to an awareness to life's enchantment. A world that possibly, at least according to physics, might just have been created by an artist who filled the world with beautiful ideas. And so my prayer is this, Lord, make me an idiot. Let me learn finally that I am not the center of the universe. Let me focus on the garden I'm supposed to tend, the garden of goodness and justice. Let me learn to marvel at creation. And let me be quiet for once and let others shout so that I can be humble and tend to the life and the people right in front of me. And let it start now. Amen. Yeah. 
So as we close out the service, I don't know who you came here with this morning, and so I don't want to encourage physical touching that you're uncomfortable with, but maybe you came with your partner and you're okay to take their hand. But I'm going to give everybody a benediction. So if you came here with someone and you want to hold their hand or you're sitting next to someone you like, you're welcome to take their hand. Okay. May the truth that sets us free and the hope that never dies and the love that casts out fear lead us forward together until the day spring breaks and all shadows flee away.